I now want to look even more deeply at the fake electors scheme. Every four years, citizens from all over the United States go to the polls to elect their president. Under our Constitution, when we cast our votes for president, we are actually voting to send electors pledged to our preferred candidate to the Electoral College. In December, the electors in each state meet, cast their votes, and send those votes to Washington. There is only one legitimate slate of electors from each state. On the sixth day of January, Congress meets in a joint session to count those votes, and the winner of the Electoral College vote becomes the president. In this next segment, you'll hear how President Trump and his campaign were directly involved in advancing and coordinating the plot to replace legitimate Biden electors with fake electors not chosen by the voters. You'll hear how this campaign convinced these fake electors to cast and submit their votes through fake certificates, telling them that their votes would only be used in the event that President Trump won his legal challenges. Yet when the president lost those legal challenges, when courts rejected them as frivolous and without merit, the fake elector scheme continued. At this point, President Trump's own lawyers, so-called Team Normal, walked away rather than participate in the plan. And his own White House counsel's office said that the plan was not legally sound. Let's play the following video produced by the Select Committee. My name is Casey Lucier. I'm an investigative counsel for the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. On November 18th, a lawyer working with the Trump campaign named Kenneth Cheesebro wrote a memo arguing that the Trump campaign should organize its own electors in the swing states that President Trump had lost. The Select Committee received testimony that those close to President Trump began planning to organize fake electors for Trump in states that Biden won in the weeks after the election. Who do you remember being involved in those early discussions around the Thanksgiving time um, regarding having alternate electors meet? Mr. Giuliani, several of Mr. Giuliani's associates, Mr. Meadows. Um, members of Congress, although it's difficult to distinguish if the, if the members that I'm thinking of were involved during Thanksgiving or if they were involved as we progressed through December. At the president's direct request, the RNC assisted the campaign in coordinating this effort. What did the president say when he called you? Essentially, he turned the call over to Mr. Eastman, who then proceeded to talk about the importance of the RNC helping the campaign gather these contingent electors in case any of the legal challenges um, that were ongoing changed the result of any of the dates. I think more just helping them reach out and, and assemble them. But the my understanding is the campaign did take the lead and we just were helping them in that, in that role. As President Trump and his supporters continued to lose lawsuits, some campaign lawyers became convinced that convening electors in states that Trump lost was no longer appropriate. I just remember, I either, I either replied or called somebody saying, unless we have litigation pending that's like in these states, like, I don't think this is appropriate or, you know, this isn't the right thing to do. I don't remember how I phrased it, but um, and I got into a little bit of a back and forth and I think it was with Ken Cheeseboro, um, where I said, all right, you know, I mean, you just get after it. Like, I, I'm out. At that point, um, I had Josh Finley email Mr. Chesbro politely to say, this is your task. You are responsible for the Electoral College issues moving forward. And this was my way of taking that responsibility to zero. The committee learned the White House Counsel's Office also felt the plan was potentially illegal. And so to be clear, did you hear the White House Counsel's Office say that um, this plan to have alternate electors meet and cast votes for Donald Trump in states that he had lost was not legally sound? Yes, sir. And who was present for that meeting that you remember? Mr. It was in our office. It was Mr. Meadows, Mr. Giuliani, and a few of Mr. Giuliani's associates. The Select Committee interviewed several of the individual fake electors, as well as Trump campaign staff who helped organize the effort. We were just, you know, kind of kind of useful idiots or rubes at that point. You know, a strong part of me really feels that it's just kind of as the road continued and as that was 
fail your failure failure that 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 got formulated as what do we have on the table um let's just do it and and now after what we've told you today about the select committee's investigation about the conclusion of the professional lawyers on the campaign staff justin clark matt morgan and, and josh finley about their um, unwillingness to participate in the convening of these electors um how does that contribute to your understanding of these issues i'm i'm angry i'm angry um because i think i think in a sense you know no one really cared uh if if people were potentially putting themselves in jeopardy would you have not wanted to participate in this any further as well i absolutely would not have had i know that the three main lawyers for the campaign um, that I've spoken to in the past and were leading up were, were not on board. Um, yeah. I was told that these would only count if a court ruled in our favor. So that would have been um, using our electors. Um, well, it would have been using our electors in ways that we weren't told about um, and we wouldn't have supported. Documents obtained by the select committee indicate that instructions were given to the electors in several states that they needed to cast their ballots in complete secrecy. Because this scheme involved fake electors, those participating in certain states had no way to comply with state election laws, like where the electors were supposed to meet. One group of fake electors even considered hiding overnight to ensure that they could access the state capitol, as required in Michigan. Did Mr. Norton say who he was working with at all on this effort to have electors meet? He said he was working with the president's campaign. He told me um, that the Michigan Republican electors were planning to meet in the Capitol and hide overnight so that they could fulfill the role of casting their vote in per law in the Michigan uh, uh, chambers. And um, I told him in no uncertain terms that that was insane and inappropriate. In one state, the fake electors even asked for a promise that the campaign would pay their legal fees if they got sued or charged with a crime. Ultimately, fake electors did meet on December 14th, 2020 in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Nevada, and Wisconsin. At the request of the Trump campaign, the electors from these battleground states signed documents falsely asserting that they were the, quote, duly elected electors from their state and submitted them to the National Archives and to Vice President Pence in his capacity as president of the Senate. Here is what some of the fake elector certificates look like as compared to the real ones. But these ballots had no legal effect. In an email produced to the select committee, Dr. Eastman told a Trump campaign representative that it did not matter that the electors had not been approved by a state authority. Quote, the fact that we have multiple slates of electors demonstrates the uncertainty of either. That should be enough. He urged that Pence act boldly and be challenged. Documents produced to the select committee show that the Trump campaign took steps to ensure that the physical copies of the fake electors' electoral votes from two states were delivered to Washington for January 6th. Text messages exchanged between Republican Party officials in Wisconsin show that on January 4th, the Trump campaign asked for someone to fly their fake electors' documents to Washington. A staffer for Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson texted a staffer for Vice President Pence just minutes before the beginning of the joint session. This staffer stated that Senator Johnson wished to hand deliver to the Vice President the fake electors' votes from Michigan and Wisconsin. The vice president's aide unambiguously instructed them not to deliver the fake votes to the vice president. Even though the fake elector slates were transmitted to Congress and the executive branch, the vice president held firm in his position that his role was to count lawfully submitted electoral votes. Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida has received 232 votes which is what he did when the joint session resumed on January 6th after the attack on the Capitol. What we just heard in that video was an aide to the White House Chief of Staff 
telling this committee that the White House Counsel's Office felt that this fake electors plan was not legally sound. Nevertheless, the Trump campaign went forward with the scheme anyway. Speaker Bowers, were you aware that fake electors had met in Phoenix on December 14th and purported to cast electoral votes for President Trump? I was not. Uh, when you learned that these electors had met and sent their electoral votes to Washington, what did you think? Well, I thought of the book, The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight. And I just thought, this is a, this is a tragic parody. Mr. Bowers, I understand that as you flew from Phoenix to Washington yesterday, you reflected upon some passages from a personal journal that you were keeping in December 2020 while all of this was taking place. Uh, with your permission, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share one passage in particular with us. Thank you very much. It is painful to have friends who have been such a help to me turn on me with such rancor. I may, in the eyes of men, not hold correct opinions or act according to their vision or convictions, but I do not take this current situation in a light manner, a fearful manner, or a vengeful manner. I do not want to be a winner by cheating. I will not play with laws I swore allegiance to. With any contrived desire towards deflection of my deep foundational desire to follow God's will as I believe he led my conscience to embrace. How else will I ever approach him in the wilderness of life, knowing that I ask this guidance only to show myself a coward in defending the course he let me take, he led me to take. Thank That's you, Mr. Speaker. Those are powerful words. I understand that taking the courageous positions that you did following the 2020 election in defense of the rule of law and protecting the voters of Arizona resulted in you and your family being subjected to protests and terrible threats. Uh, can you tell us how this impacted you and your family? Well, as others in the videos have mentioned, we received, um, my secretaries would say, in excess of 20,000 emails and tens of thousands of voicemails and texts, which saturated our offices and we were unable to work at least communicate. But at home, um, up till even recently, uh, it is the new pattern or a pattern in our lives to worry what will happen on Saturdays because we have various groups come by and they have had um, video panel trucks with videos of me proclaiming me to be a pedophile and a pervert and a corrupt and politician and blaring uh, loudspeakers in my neighborhood and leaving literature both on my property but arguing and threatening with neighbors and with myself. Um, I, I don't know if I should name groups but there was a one gentleman that had the three bars on his chest and he had a pistol and was threatening my neighbor, not with the pistol, but just vocally. When I saw the gun, I knew I had to get close. And at the same time, on some of these, we had a daughter who was gravely ill who was upset by what was happening outside. And my wife, that was a valiant person, very, very strong, quiet, very strong woman. So 
So it was disturbing. It was disturbing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for your service to the state of Arizona and to the country. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I think it would be appropriate to take a short recess.